Today we're going to have a short discussion about some ways that you could potentially use to hopefully make a guard army just that little bit stronger. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focus 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So today we're going to put a lot of small tips together and just talk about a few ways where you can change a guard army list to maybe just be a little bit stronger without altering the core tactics of the army list. I think most people aren't going to be making sweeping changes to their guard army overnight, either due to the miniatures that you have in the collection or already being fairly happy with the tactics and strategy that you're going for. So I try and see this as more sort of an ideas list for things that you might think about changing, tweaking or experimenting with that I think in most circumstances will make a guard list a bit stronger. There'll be a mix of fairly basic simple stuff and a few slightly more advanced discussions as well. And I've broken it down into three sections, ideas for which units to think about taking or leaving out, ideas for how to equip certain units, and then ideas on force organisation and how you can structure a guard army list to get a few advantages. Let's jump straight into it then. So first of all, let's talk about some ideas of which units to take to optimise a guard list. First of all, I think possibly at the top of the list for small changes that you can make to your army is strongly thinking about taking three astropaths with las pistols. These guys are 15 points a pop, some of the most undercosted units in the entire army, and hopefully they'll only cost 45 points to slot into any guard list, so it's not very hard to make room for them. They'll give you three denies, potentially ignoring cover for enemy infantry units, but also generally I'd take these three very useful psychic powers. Psychic Maelstrom to throw an extra few mortal wounds into the enemy, and maybe even snipe characters. Night Shroud to make one unit minus one to hit, and Psychic Barrier to make one unit plus one to their saves. Maelstrom's just a very nice damage increase, and Night Shroud and Psychic Barrier you should be trying to aim to put on the unit each turn that you think your opponent is most likely to want to shoot. As Force Multipliers for a Guard Army, they're just incredibly undercosted and really good choices for optimising a list. If you're taking three or four Basilisks, or maybe even Wyverns, you could think about giving them some reroll ones, either with a Master of Ordnance or Gunnery Sergeant Harker. If you are getting three or four of these guys, or maybe you're shooting one twice with the Emperor's Wrath Artillery Company formation, then the Master, I think, is on the side of the Master of Ordnance being a worthwhile investment. Reroll ones at greater than 36 inches is pretty decent, plus you also get the benefit of his own shooting attack to add to the potential Alpha Strike, so I think he's a very reasonable pickup if you're not already playing Cadian. Next, if your tanks are modelled with Vanquisher Battle Cannons, then unfortunately they're just some of the worst guns in the Codex at the moment, I'm afraid. They're mathematically inferior to the Battle Cannon against literally every target, including heavy armour, as well as being laughably worse against infantry and lighter targets. Basically, I think very few people will generally mind if you're running Vanquishers as regular Battle Cannons, even if you want to keep them on the turrets just for rule of cool. I've seen some people use them to demarcate the Hammer of Sundrance, the relic from the Vigilus formation that gives your Battle Cannon flat damage 3 which just makes the Vanquisher tank feel like it's an actual anti-tank hunter rather than just a very unreliable one-shot wonder. Next, in terms of infantry and orders, I'd be trying to get an appropriate amount of order levels for the infantry. You can have too little, but you can also have too many. Basically, if you were, say, taking a large amount of infantry in your guard army, say you had 12 infantry squads, I'd be looking to have about 3 or 4 officers to give them orders. Something around 6 to 8 orders I think would be pretty optimal for that amount of infantry. I don't think that you need orders for literally every single infantry unit, because basically you're going to be taking casualties quite early in the game, the guard infantry die in droves, and it could be in the situation where even turn 1 you've lost 3 or 4 infantry squads, so if you'd bought orders for every single infantry squad, then you'd already have wasted several orders. Basically, as a rough rule of thumb, I'd aim to have about 2 or 3 orders in my army for every 4 infantry squads that I've included. Sure, a couple might have to do without for a turn, but as you take casualties, pretty much everyone should be guaranteed an order pretty quickly, and you're not left with redundant officers after that happens. I would try and have something like this level of orders available though, as they just take the infantry to the next level. Tricks like move, 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 and first rank fire, second rank fire, just make our 4 point infantry behave like they're so much more valuable. In terms of filling out an army, if you're just looking for a few more units to take your list up to a certain point level, I strongly consider things just like general workhorse units, things like infantry squads, basilisks, or Lehman Rust demolishers. You're very rarely going to go wrong by including more of any of these in a guard army. The more infantry you have, the more you'll put strain on the enemy's anti-infantry fire, there'll be better screening, there'll be better capturing objectives. Basilisks are really quite decent, ignores line of sight firepower good for finishing off some annoying units that are trying to lurk on objectives, or just chipping into anti-tank firepower wherever you most need it on the map. And Lehman Rust Demolishers are both quite cheap, and some of the most efficient anti-tank firepower we have in the Codex. They basically need to be destroyed by the enemy, otherwise they are going to make a mess, and this makes them a good distraction Carnifex unit, as it means that they'll have less firepower to dedicate to your other threats. 
Conversely, if I had the option, I'd generally try and avoid certain units from the Guard Codex if you had the options to sub them out. Things like Death Strike Missiles, World Bane Psychers, Devil Dogs and Bane Wolves, and Ogryn Squads just aren't particularly good for their points in the Codex at the moment. Death Strikes are very unreliable and might not even contribute to the game for several turns. World Veins just aren't able to cast Psychic Powers reliably, as well as being quite expensive. Though I admit, if you are pairing them with a Primary Psyker, there is a useful stratagem in the Psychic Awakening book that does let them cast a little bit better. Although still, I think they're a bit suboptimal compared with Astropaths. Devil Dog Melter Cannons are just pretty much flatly inferior to Lehman Rush Demolishers in pretty much every circumstance. Bane Wolves only have very limited targets that they're going to be successful against and are really short-ranged and Ogryn's almost entirely inferior to standard infantry squads with the way that Games Workshop has chosen to price them. I'm not saying that all of these units are useless and can't have battlefield roles, but in general at the moment they do tend to struggle in a more competitive environment, and for the most part if you swap them out for something else then it's generally going to be the better option. Fingers crossed some points cuts on these guys in the new edition. Moving on to unit upgrades and equipment ideas. Generally I'm a massive fan of taking heavy stubbers and storm bolters on vehicles wherever you can, just two points to add an extra couple of strength 4 shots to your army is generally going to be worth it, even if they fire only a couple of times per game. I honestly think that they're even worth it on backfield artillery tanks, as there are going to be situations where they're going to get line of sight on things, and if you're playing a slow melee horde, then deploying them in line of sight and just opening up with more shots is going to be far stronger. Generally speaking, I'd take heavy stubbles on anything that's going to be stationary, or things that are going to be hitting on at least a 4+, such as Imperial Guard tank commanders, who will still be hitting on 4s even when they move. I'd also tend to prefer heavy stubbers on Talarn units as well, as again they'll be hitting on 4s on the move. Otherwise, if you've got advancing tanks that'll be hitting on 5s otherwise, then I'd swap out for the Storm Bolter, on things like Hellhounds, or standard Lehman Rust Demolishers that are going to be taking the fight to the enemy. If you're not already using Tank Ace traits from the Psychic Awakening book, I generally recommend them, and they're well worth Command Point investment. In particular, if you have a Basilisk in your army, then in one Command Point for flat 3 damage throughout the whole game is certainly a worthwhile upgrade. And if you've got a tank commander, then you can either upgrade their firepower, or upgrade their defensive capabilities, either with a 2 plus armor save, or my personal favorite, the minus 1 damage trait. Basically like having an iron stone on your tank commander the entire game long, it's either going to keep them safe and unshot, or your opponent's just going to have to pay through the nose with a lot more firepower than they otherwise would have needed to. Again, if you do have a tank commander and you've got a battle cannon on them, if you have enough command points, I'd certainly recommend taking the Vigilist Detachment, the Emperor's Fist Tank Company, and taking the Hammer of Sundrance Relic with it. Flat 3 damage over D3 damage is a massive upgrade for a battle cannon. It makes them 50% more effective against enemy armor, and even better than this against 3 wound infantry such as Primaris Aggressors. A Hammer of Sundrance Tank Commander with minus 1 damage is an absolute staple in a lot of my lists. In terms of infantry squads, even if you're just using them as cheap screens, if you can be bothered to model them, then having a bolter on each sergeant is really quite a good shout at the moment. Guard sergeants can't take a las gun, so getting a bolter will allow them to be able to chip into the unit's firepower, and you'd be surprised just how much that extra random bolter shot actually causes another casualty that you wouldn't have had anyway. Say if you did have 12 infantry squads across an entire army, spending a meagre 12 points for 12 bolters, will on average kill something like an extra 3 orc boys every single turn. That's assuming that they're firing at long range, and even then they make back their points in just one round of firepower. Never mind if they get to fire some of them for a second time, or get any of them in rapid fire at some point in the game. Point for point, these are some of the strongest upgrades in firepower in the guard army, even though obviously you can't take very many of them. For the same reason, I'd strongly consider taking bolters on platoon commanders, company commanders, and replacing bolt pistols with bolters on commissars as well. These guys have slightly better ballistic skill, and they are fairly likely to incidentally chip away with a few more wounds over the course of the game, particularly as they're going to be surviving a little bit later into the game due to being able to be screened by the infantry. Bear in mind though that if you are using these, I wouldn't let the one point upgrade interfere with the movement of those units. That is of course the most important thing, and if they need to advance then it's better that they do that. However, for one point for a ballistic skill 3 plus bolter, even if just one or two of them get to fire at some point in the game, then they've got a reasonable chance of making their points cost for the entire batch of them that you buy, all in one go. In terms of other upgrades, I'd try and drop things that are more sort of like luxury picks, if you really want to be getting the absolute most out of a guard army, although I admit things like random power swords and things are fun. If you do want to try and squeeze a bit more efficiency out of the guard list, then it's really going to be a good buy to buy power weapons on things like sergeants, and the only time that I'd ever consider it in some sort of competitive situation is maybe if you're taking a Cast Chan melee death ball and stacking them with lots of extra attacks, say from Strachan and Ministorum priests and things. I think only then do they begin to be worth it, and even then you're passing up the free chainsword, which does give you an extra attack, which is pretty handy as well. Unless you're going very big on the melee strategy, then typically I'd be sticking with your chainswords. 
They're free, and they often can be actually a superior choice when you're targeting things like demons or lower armor saves such as orcs. Finally, as a general principle for upgrades, the guard weapons tend to be priced around them being able to be shot by a ballistic skill 4 plus platform. That means if you're ever buying expensive upgrades for things that are likely to be firing on ballistic skill 5 plus, then it's generally a bad idea. Sponsons on Lehman Ross tanks can be a bit of a good example of this. Basically, Lehman Ross tanks are often going to have to move to reposition to be able to get fire lanes or get in range of stuff, and it means that heavy bolter sponsons, if the tank's moving, are going to be hitting on fives unless they're Talon. This means that you've really been paying for those heavy bolters at a premium, when they're often going to be firing at only two-thirds the effectiveness of ones that are hitting on the standard fours. It means that Lehman Ross sponsons aren't the best option on things that you think are going to be moving, but a pretty decent buy-ins on Talon tanks, where you know that they're pretty much going to be firing on fours the whole game. The same goes for Sentinel heavy weapons. If you think that they're going to be moving most of the game, then there's no point giving them missile launches or last cannons. I would just stick with the cheap multi-laser. On the other hand, it does mean if we have any other high ballistic skill platforms, say veteran squads or tank commanders, then it's often worth spending a little bit more on their guns, as if they're stationary, then you're actually going to be paying for the same weapons, but they'll be firing with a better damage output. I know that you pay a little bit more for the platform for these, but it means that if you're paying for an expensive platform, it also makes sense to get the most out of it by giving that platform good guns. For example, if I'm fielding a veteran squad that's just going to be sitting in the back, maybe plinky away with some sniper rifles, I strongly think about buying in a last cannon for them, as typically your 15 point last cannons are going to be hitting on 4s, but if you buy it there, it's going to be hitting on 3s. It's just a little bit more incentivized than normal. Same for the Lehman Rust tank commanders, I'll be a lot more tempted to put sponsons on those guys, as if they move, they're still hitting on 4s, which is kind of fine, and if they stay still, then they can be hitting on 3s, so you're getting very good value out of those weapons for the same points that you might have paid for it elsewhere. There's a few cases such as plasma guns and melter guns that pay more for the ballistic skill 3 plus platform. Obviously they're a little bit more equivocal, and the fact that they have a price disparity actually means that you're more incentivized to take things like grenade launchers on veteran squads, as you don't pay any extra for them for the increased ballistic skill. Finally, let's talk a fair bit about ideas for force organization for the guards and trying to optimize an army list. First of all, on the most basic level, form as many detachments as you can to get the most CP. Say if you're fielding two battalions, but you have tons of heavy support in those battalions, consider breaking off another one to get a spearhead for an extra command point. If you are running a spearhead or something as well, then it could often be worth putting your Lehman Rosses in that formation, just because it gives them objective secured as the special rule from the start of the guard codex mentions. In general, the more competitive guard lists for the most part will often be made up of different regiments. It's just because some regiments are better for certain units, such as custom tank regiments being excellent for things like demolishers, where I'd argue that things like Kascham might be one of the strongest regiments for infantry. For the most part, there's no real reason not to do this, other than a few slightly problematic choices that you can be made to have, such as say if you want to take a whole load of tanks in one detachment and give them the tank traits, then if you want to fill out the detachment with infantry to make a battalion for more CP, then of course those infantry won't be able to be ordered by any of the other officers in your other detachments. So there is a little bit of a trade-off, but in a lot of lists I think that having different detachments for different role units is optimal. I do really like the custom regiment traits from the new Greater Good book, and if you're running a bunch of tanks, whether they're demolishers, basilisks, or anything else, then you can take your pick of two of the any three good ones, which are plus six inch to the range of their heavy weapons, re-rolling the number of shots for their blast weapons, or getting the auto repairs ability, where they heal either one or d3 wounds each turn. They're all excellent traits, obviously the six inch range one is great for demolishers and punishers, and just in raw strength, tanks are generally going to be stronger than this. For artillery or gun lines, then Cadian is an excellent option. Rerolling ones when stationary is pretty self-explanatory. They can gain access to the Relic of Lost Cadia for four rerolls against Chaos, or just reroll ones to wound for a turn. And they have overlapping fields of fire to give you a little bit of ballistic skill boost against one target. I often like putting my artillery in a Cadian detachment for those various stacking benefits. Finally, Kastchan infantry screens I think are some of the strongest that we have in the guard. Just being able to combine them with Strachan and a Ministorum Priest means that your infantry death wave can not only shoot you to death with las guns, but also punch you to death with strength 4 melee attacks. Kastchan is a bit of a mix as well. They do have the re-roll number of shots for the vehicles as well, which is another very solid bonus. One of my favourite ways to run guard is to have two battalions full of Kastchan infantry, so 120 guys wading forward with the extra attacks, screening a fire support element potentially Acadian artillery detachments, or maybe even something like a bunch of Lehman Rust demolishers, with the extra range and reroll in the number of shots. In terms of Warlord traits, if you're not using them already, then I either recommend Old Grudges or Grand Strategist. Old Grudges is great for just nuking one enemy Death Star unit, or just basically making your firepower extra efficient against whatever unit you wanted to kill first in a game. 
It really helps you get good damage output right from the get-go. And Grand Strategist we all know and love. 5 plus command point farming is generally going to make its command points back over the course of the game. Plus that one extra random reroll never hurts. I think for most builds that these are going to be better than virtually anything else the Warlord traits have to offer. They're just a bit good. If in your list you're running a Militarum Tempestus Scion Detachment, then you have quite a powerful option to be able to bring in another Warlord trait for just one command point. The best thing is that you don't have to take this from the unique Tempestus Scion Warlord traits, you can very much have one of the other ones from the main book, and I quite like the way that you could have both Old Grudges and Grand Strategist on the table if you wanted both. Tempesta Primes are a little bit more expensive than Company Commanders, but it's not the biggest waste just literally to have one just to mill around at the back of the army, and use one of these buffs just to support the army in general, while your other Tempestas lead and order the Scions. If you are using Scion Regiments and haven't already, then again using the Psychic Awakening Scion Regiment traits is a really good idea. The vast majority of them are stronger than the Stormtroopers Doctrine from the Guard Codex. If you're unsure which one to go for, then the Lambdon Lions are a great shout. An extra pip of AP never hurts whether you're firing hotshot las guns or overcharged plasma. And they have a good Relic and Warlord trait that allow you to reroll ones to hit and give you a 5 plus inball save. And of course there are many other Scion Regiments if one of those better suits your detachment's purposes. Finally, again if you aren't using them already, then consider the Vigilist Detachments. The ones that I most make use of would be either the Emperor's Wrath Artillery Company or the Emperor's Fist Tank Company. We've already talked about the Emperor's Fist. One command point to get access to a flat 3 damage battle cannon is great, plus it has the very useful ability to be able to move a Lehman Russ the full 10 inches and still double fire its turret weapon. That one comes in handy more than you'd expect, as your Lehman Russes aren't always going to be optionally positioned to be able to double fire. The Emperor's Wrath Artillery Company, we've mentioned several times before on the channel. This one gives you a couple of extra buffs that you can give to a Master of Ordnance or a Company Commander, allowing you to ignore cover with one artillery piece per turn, or getting a bit of AP on one of your unit's shots. Though the main benefit from it, in my opinion, is being able to shoot one of your artillery pieces twice. Two command points for a whole extra round of Basilisk fire, particularly when that Basilisk can be a tank ace with flat 3 damage. It's just an excellent way of converting command points into raw damage. The suppressive fire option isn't too bad either. Now I know a lot of that was probably fairly basic stuff, but I hope that that's at least given a bit of food for thought for ways to improve guard lists. If you've got any other ideas to add to the big pile, then please let us know down in the comments below. In general, I'll be looking for simple changes that will almost guarantee an increase in efficiency when you're choosing a guard army. I'm sure there must be plenty more out there. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe for plenty more Imperial Guard content coming out fairly regularly on the channel. And if you've been enjoying all the videos, I'd just like to mention the Allspex Tactics Patreon page, which is what allows me to spend all this time making 40k content, as opposed to picking up shifts on my regular everyday job. As well as keeping the videos coming, patrons do get a few other benefits, such as being able to see certain videos early, regular votes on what sort of videos you would like to see next on the channel, and regular monthly prize draws where I post out free miniatures to a random Patreon. So if any of that sounds good, or you'd just like to help keep these videos coming, then the link is in the video description below. In any case, a really massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.